Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Volpe Creates Show, the weekly talk show about video games, technology, and creativity. Uh, my name is Chris Volpe, joined as always by Baby Girl. And Lucas, how are you today? Oh, I'm doing great, Chris. How about you? Good. I'll put her in her little bed here. Uh, doing good. It's uh, been a week. We've had a lot of these weeks. Yeah, um, definitely. Seems, seems to be how the world just works. Just more weeks keep coming. Yep. The weather in Ohio here has been really weird. Got hail mm -hmm. earlier this week, and then it's 50s now. Like, I don't even know, man. Yeah, I went for a run yesterday. It's a little chilly today. Do you want to get down, sweetheart? Bitchin'. Um, so, Lucas, a couple things. Yeah. You are three weeks away from graduation, is that correct? Yes, I am. I graduate May 7th this year, the Saturday. Sweet. So every week I'm going to keep mentioning it yeah. as we count down to Lucas becomes a full-fledged adult. Yeah, um, I can't wait. It's been five <laughs> years counting, and I'm sick of it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, as always, we are joined by a special guest. This guest, or this, week, this week's guest, is Dante. How are you, man? I'm doing all right, man. How you feeling? Good, good. So first of all, thank you for uh, being on the show. I appreciate it. I'm excited to talk to you. We have not spoken, I think, much since uh, COVID times. So. We have not. And I, I apologize. Do you Did you ever get to see when I was um, walking around with the stray cat? No, I mean, you t you've told me about it. I've never seen it. Was, <laughs> the cat, the stray cat, I would go to the park and it, it would assist me on walks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, it would have been cool if I could introduce the cat the way you introduce baby. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, I got my straight cat. You got your dog, you know. But, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, I got, uh, I got my little cat, too, who may make an appearance here. Uh, but uh, every time I try to take her out on a walk, I put her in, like, a leash or, like, the harness thing. And she just spends the whole time on the ground complaining about it instead of actually <laughs> enjoying the outside. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cats are different than dogs, man. Yeah. She is a sweetie. She's also a hellion. But um, so I want to start. Uh, you mentioned this, too. Uh, and I was actually having a just complete side conversation with another person last week. But uh, we met doing TEDx. We did a TEDx talk. Uh, yeah. 20 was that 2016, 2015, yeah, I don't 2016, November 2016. 2016. Never forget it. OK, you've got it down. I can't remember anything mm -hmm. anymore. Um, <laughs> But I, I remember uh, we had a couple like the little intro sessions where, uh, you know, they wanted to make sure we had our talks and stuff together. And then we had kind of like a little meet and greet uh, dinner thing. And I think we, we kind of chatted and for whatever reason, I think we just sort of connected pretty, pretty quickly and, yeah. and, and started chatting. But I also remember that like watching your... Uh, because we before we did the talk, we all kind of did our preview talks, and I was in the audience for yours, and you did your talk, and I was like, holy shit, that was amazing. Like, <laughs> it was way better than my talk. Way better. Uh, so, first of all, I would encourage folks to uh, YouTube it, because uh, you can. it's still up there. Uh, Dante Wood Spikes, if you search TEDx, Dante Wood Spikes, you'll, you'll be able to see it. It's, it's really really good and in, in my opinion and, and i i guess i'm gonna kick it to you um yeah. why why like why that topic i think the the general topic was risk right if i'm not mistaken yep. um so why why that topic why'd you go that that direction so what's interesting it was interesting before i get into it i want to talk about what was going on before i even made it to that point um, you know, at that time in my life, I really wasn't doing too much. I was just now figuring out different things I wanted to do. And the way I made it to TEDx was someone said, Dante, you would give a great TEDx talk. And at this time, I didn't know what TEDx was. So I'm like, who's Ted? You know, mm -hmm. why am I talking for him? He can talk for himself. He don't need me. In my head, that's literally what I'm thinking. But yeah. I started to see uh, different videos, and I it still didn't register. But I had submitted the proposal, and I ended up being selected. And what's interesting, I remember when we had our first meeting with all of us together. Um, 
I felt so much like the odd man out because I was much younger. I was still in college and I really didn't have a full idea of what I wanted to do, who I was. And, you know, we're going around in a circle and people are like, well, you know, I went to the moon and I came back to Earth. <laughs> The other person is like, well, I created a time machine, so I went back in time and talked to all the presidents. And then they get to me, and they're like, well, what, what do you do, Dante? And I'm like, well, I'm in college, and I like to eat food. My favorite color is green. Ah, that's all I know to tell you. <laughs> Your favorite but color is green? I it just, is. I just learned something about you. <laughs> but uh, I remember asking Ruth, um, the organizer at TEDx Columbus, like, why? Why'd you pick me? What is it? She was like, Dante, you got a story to tell. And after that, I was like, all right, no more going back and forth, no more doubting myself. Let's get into it. And the topic that I chose to talk about was the experiences of young Black men in the city and what it's like to develop relationships and connections with them. What usually happens is after tragedy strikes, that's when people get involved or interested or play stock in working with young black men. But my message was, hey, you don't have to wait until that happens. You also don't have to be a part of some major organization or nonprofit or institution. You can just show up as yourself because me personally, the people that left the biggest impact on me were the people that were available and the people that would talk to me and just just be there. It had nothing to do with anything else. And I wanted to reinforce that idea and concept and remind all the people in the crowd that they are capable of doing those things. And um, what was interesting was most of the demographics at TEDx are older and older female and white. So it was the complete opposite it was just like i really want to talk to you about what is going on the discussions you might hear on television or podcasts whatever it may be but i want to look you dead in the face and say hey just show up that's mm -hmm. all people need sometimes that's uh you gave me a handful there so the, the first thing <laughs> the, the tragedy part i think is, is true i think that's just a I don't know if it's, an, I don't think it's just an American thing. I think it just might be a people thing where, you know, you don't really focus on something until it kind of like blasts you in the face, you know? And right. unfortunately, um, a lot of those times, like, you know, with a lot of the troubles, for example, in different neighborhoods are heavily poverty based. And like, 100%. that's something you could work on remedying so that these issues don't blow up right. in your face. Right. Exactly. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And, and, um, before I ask my question, I do want to, cause you, you brought up a good point that the TEDx, the TED talks in general, particularly like the, the mainline TED talks are very like Silicon Valley. -y, like mm -hmm. you tend to be, it, it is, it's older affluent mm -hmm. white folks in general yeah. that, that, that are a part of that. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really astute observation and like knowing this audience and, and I've got a wrap around to that, but, mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you first because one of the one of the parts you mentioned about the being available was uh, part of your talk was your connection, your initial connection to like white women mm -hmm. as a child, mm -hmm. um, and then how that has since developed over time. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to chat about that for a second? Because I found that yeah. really really intriguing. So it's it's very interesting. <laughs> so as a child, I actually started off at a predominantly white school. Um, and it was cool. I, I, I definitely recognized that I was one of the few black students at the school, but just the way the school was set up, the things that happened, the food that we ate, everything was good. I loved it. And then the next year, and this was kindergarten, then the next year, the first grade, I had to shift to another school. And this is where it was predominantly black children. And we still had white teachers, mostly female white teachers. But there was a major shift from the culture of the classroom, the materials that we had available in the classroom, and the way we were treated. So as a kid, 
I'm not looking at the bigger picture or the grand scheme of things. All I know is what's right in front of my face. So yeah. I made the connection that, so if I'm at a school and the children are predominantly white, we're going to be treated better. But if I'm in a school where the children are predominantly black, they're going to be treated worse. And in most cases, you have a white female teacher. And that was the first thing that I saw. It was the first time I was yelled at in my life. It was the first time I was punished in my life. It was the first time I felt anxiety. So all of those feelings were connected to white female teachers. So as time had passed, now that I'm older and I work in the education system, the main people that I work with happen to be white female teachers. So what makes it so interesting is now as an adult, I get to look back at the classroom culture. I get to see the amount of emphasis that is placed on standardized testing, the uh, um, lack of funds and resources and how that impacts the classroom. So on, on one end, I've been able to develop um, an empathetic approach to a lot of the teachers because they don't have everything they need to be the best teacher they can be. And I understand that. But I also see that we do need some cultural competency that is embedded inside of the classrooms and schools so we can better figure out how can we give every single child a fair opportunity at the education system. Yeah, I, I think jumping back for a second, you used empathy. Uh, empathy has kind of become your thing, right? That's sort of your brand. We got you as the empathetic gamer. Um, that's but I, th I, th but I think a, a lot of it, uh, that and uh, your procrastination means. <laughs> I, th I think those are your two, your two brands right now. Uh -huh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, uh, so for those who don't know on, uh, you know, on Facebook friends with him, he has a little meme where it's just, it's his face that he's got this like kind of interesting, goofy picture. And it, there's always something about like, are you working right now? Or like, I've caught you procrastinating, you know? So it's sort of like our, our daily uh, reminder to, to keep the grind going, keep hustling. Um, but the, the empathetic side, I, I want to bring out your book, uh, which I read um, and really, really enjoyed. I also found it pretty intriguing. Um, I'll let you describe sort of the, how the book kind of got started, because COVID also played a big role in it. Um, but you also spoke a lot about your struggles and challenges dealing with students, uh, even from your perspective. So there's, there's the, the teacher kind of level where they're kind of navigating it. There's the, I don't know, societal, social level, if you want to call it that, and like the way schools are sort of organized and funded. Um, but even at your position, which was, I would say, almost more personal than the teachers in a lot of ways. Uh, it was. Um, that you were, you were even sometimes struggling or having off days or, you know, feeling burnt out or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about your sort of take on that side of it. Yeah. So how the book came about was through COVID actually. Um, I was at a place at the school where I was really starting to dive into being empathetic which is became my brand, but being empathetic with children, being intentional about teaching them what that means and also providing new opportunities. But as soon, like as soon as I started to do it, that's when COVID came around and COVID happened right as my birthday was coming up. Yeah, so, you birthday. know, I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> but, um, as time passed, you know, we had a, about a month where we thought we would go back next month, but that didn't happen. So another month happened and they said, we're still not going back. So the last couple of months, they said, you know, everybody just stay home and we're going to reconnect next year. So I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to have the chance to go back to the school and engage with all of these kids the way I wanted to. But I had got a letter in the mail saying that we don't need you at this school anymore. So I was still in the school system, but I they, I was not needed at that school anymore because I was there on a grant. So I, w I was an employee, but I was there as a, on a grant. So the grant money ran out. I was no longer there. Um, I went to another school. I liked it. It was great. But I 
was so connected to the children at the last school. At this new school, I just couldn't mesh with the children, the staff, and the environment the way I did at the last school. So why, why I, do you think that was? I, it was so different. It was it was a, a different space. You know, being used to one space is very serious. It's like moving when you're not ready to move. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, is this really my home? If I'm yeah. in a space that I'm not used to, people I don't know. Kids, you... I have I have no role in these children growing up and developing. You know, some kids, you know, since kindergarten, you see them go to third, fourth, and fifth grade. You saw that. Mm -hmm. I'm in a new space as the new person, and I see kids I've never met before, relationships that I had nothing to do with. So you feel like an outsider. Even though are, you're welcome, you just feel you like... Somebody... Are you someone that like is, is change in general hard for you, like personally? I, yes, it is very hard for me. Okay. I'm adaptable, but I do not like change. Yeah, I, I, like I hear you, man. I hear you. Also, <laughs> a lot of the things you're saying are, are almost, uh, I hesitate to say word for word, but very reminiscent of how you described your transition as a kid between uh, schools. That It is. So I've, I've never been able to get accustomed to that. Never been able to get accustomed to it. And, you know, once I had that experience, I thought the best way to reconnect with those children is to finish this book. And in the book, I talk about small moments, nothing too major or serious. But in hindsight, it is kind of serious because I made sure I zeroed in on the individual and not the label. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we label children and say, you know, they're from um, an underserved community or they're poverty stricken. And I understand using it in context to describe where children are and what's going on. But the dangers of that is once you place a label on a child, it's very hard to perceive them as someone that has an identity and someone that can be creative and can flourish. Sure. Some people have like a, a savior complex that starts to develop to where they're like, I want to help the kids. I want to I want to help them out. I want to give to them. And that's cool and all. But what I needed, like I said, at TEDx will work for me as someone just being present will work for the boys. It's just someone being present. What will work for these children is someone just being present, being authentic and seeing what works for them what works for the children. So just to give a quick breakdown for people to understand the book, there are 22 different stories um, and engagements that I've had with children that left an impact on me. The way the story started is I'm an, I was an instructional assistant. So when there was a student that probably was um, struggling in the classroom, had a, a mental breakdown or just needed a break, they would sit with me. And what I did was I started this thing called the walk and talk. So we would just walk and talk throughout the school. I love walking. But um, sometimes we would also sit down. So one kid, we went to the library and sat down and we started playing Legos and having a conversation. As this kid was talking, I started taking notes on everything that they said. And once we were done creating something with the Legos, I would take a picture of what they created. So when they were not with me, I could look at our conversation and I could also see the picture to remind me of the child. So the next time I talked to them, I would have notes to go back to the conversation and say, OK, do you feel like you're in a better space compared to the last time you felt this way? And I will mm -hmm. also challenge them to recreate what they created the last time. Y'all like my imaginary phone I keep showing yeah, I'm, you? I'm with you, yeah. You see it? You see that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> I was so, you know, challenge them to recreate it. It's all about familiarity. You know, just being familiar. And I was like, dang, that's kind of that's kind of cool. Before yeah. I know it, I started having journal entries. And then journal entries turned into a, a book. So that's how it all came to light and you know my my challenge and what i hope people get out of the book is to just understand that children have identities they all have different personalities some kids might like you some kids might not some kids like basketball some kids are into science but you have to figure out who they are and connect with them where they are really i 
really enjoyed the book and personally um I, I think i've mentioned i mentioned this in the show but you know i was going through a separation with my wife at the time COVID hit and so i was having i was personally struggling and then all the stuff that was going on politically and socially was just sort of nuts um and so i happened to trying to be like a little more mindful and empathetic to myself and those around me and then i started reading your book and i i could see these little these vignettes of your experiences with these children um and i i kind of noticed a pattern and, and tell me if i'm sort of off here i think one of the things and this is something that makes me kind of sad is that a lot of the children that you work with and i'm going to use this word it's a loaded word and maybe there's perhaps a better word for it but uh it it seemed like a lot of these children were going through some sort of trauma or challenge that yes. they were working through that i i feel is, is sad that a child has to navigate that without mm -hmm. having any of the tools like most adults can't navigate some of those challenges yeah. Uh, let alone the expectations put on a child, which of course then creates difficulties in the, in the classroom. So that, that was kind of one thing I noticed in mm -hmm. almost all your stories, followed by some sort of sense of connection mm -hmm. that you emphasize. Like I remember one of the students you mentioned, I forget now, was it Spider-Man, I think is Spider-Man or Batman that you made a connection with? That could um, speak English, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Had trouble so, speaking English, yeah. Yeah, so English was not his native language, and so um, comic books and superheroes was like that that in that you had, and there's lots of different connections that you had with students. But then the third thing that I noticed um, as part of your self reflection is a lot of times the stories ended with almost a you having a realization that you were bound by limitations in yourself, like things that you personally weren't able to, you know, you, you mentioned the savior complex, right? Like it was almost an acknowledgement that you're not going to be able to help every child the way that they need or the way that they want. Yep. Um, does that seem, th that's kind of what I think. Does that seem re reasonable? Uh, you, you're good at this. Um, <laughs> because. I wish I got paid uh, for it. <laughs> <laughs> so. My whole thing was when we talk about children, we usually lead with the trauma or we lead with the issue. With my stories, that was there, but it was in the background. You know, it was it was very present. It helped shape the story. But in the moment that I shared with them, it wasn't about that. I didn't want people to dive right into that and say, this is who this child is. Yeah. I wanted them to say, okay, this is a moment with Dante and this child. And we know that this is in the background, of course. But I really wanted people to see the individual that existed. And yeah. what happened was um, coming to the realization of understanding that I cannot always be the savior. Help me figure out what I could do in the time frame that I had with the children. So yeah. with that kid, like the one we just talked about, the one that couldn't speak English, what I would try to do as much as possible with him is when I had a little bit of time, let's get our words together. Let's let's mm -hmm. take the letters. And, you know, the, so for the people that don't know, the story is about a kid that had trouble speaking English. I didn't know that he had trouble speaking English because I would just pass him as as I'm in the school. He would say things like hi, bye. He would laugh and joke. Um, if there was a song that the kids were singing, he could easily sing along with them. But I never really had a conversation with him until the day I found out that he had trouble speaking English. And it was time for them to have a test on their spelling. So we were outside in the hallway and I came up with this idea to just like take letters and slide them at him. And I added uh, for him to be Batman and for me to be Joker because he liked Batman. So when I said, you're Batman, I'm Joker, I'm going to throw a letter at you. When I throw this letter at you, you have to tell me if it's the right or the wrong letter because we're trying to go in sequence with the alphabet. 
and I'll throw a letter at him and he would throw it back at me if it was wrong and I would do like this stupid Joker laugh. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um that gave him an opportunity in that moment to laugh, to feel comfortable, to feel embraced, to learn. And I realized that is all that I had and all that I could give to that. Um, yeah. And that is okay. When, I, when, when we recognize what we can do, that's when we know we have to reach out to someone else. Um, sometimes trying to do more than you are fully equipped to do can be dangerous. I've done that before where I tried so hard to help out that I ended up hurting a child yep. more than I thought I would help them. Now they're behind. Now, now they can't get the help that they needed because the time frame and window has been missed because I wanted to keep them under my wing. So finding out what it is you can do to help out and being able to do that and saying this is it, sometimes that's all you can do. In the book, I made sure that I was honest and say, hey, this is what I found out, and this is what I can do. Sometimes that's all you need to do too, right? Like right. Sometimes just, you said that uh, earlier, like that, just that little bit of connection, you know, uh, when you think about things like resilience uh, mm-hmm. building and stuff, sometimes it's just little incremental bits of getting them ahead, just a little bit. Yeah. And, and if you can help out that way. Uh, also, I, 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 you can mention the labels thing. I'm a big believer in the you label me, you negate me kind of idea. Yeah. Um, I and I think that's something that, and we don't have to go down this road, but just, I think in society in general, you know, people like putting things into boxes. There's just so much information and so much going on. It's just easier to kind of put stuff into boxes. But um, I think that does us a disservice overall, where mm-hmm. it just, you know, here's the, the checkbox of things you are. You are, Mm -hmm. Um, and I I think it does do a disservice in a lot of ways. Um, So I'm going to be silly for a second and jump over because we do have a question from the audience. Uh, What brand was your imaginary phone that you were holding up? (laughs) What's Um, the imaginary brand for your imaginary phone? So I'm a Samsung guy. So you remember how they had Gravity and Galaxy and, you know, Mm -hmm. they got all these different versions. I'm going to say that this one is the, the Milky Way 22. The Milky Way 22? Milky Way 22. Yeah, coming soon? Yeah, it's coming soon. I'm the first one to have it. So, you know, check it out. And- nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, just a couple quick things, because I, I want to jump into to games for sure. But uh, I've been having just a great conversation. The, the audience thing, uh, you, we mentioned that way back with the audience and the TEDx. Uh, that was also where I was coming from. I don't think my talk was nearly as good as yours, but oh, stop it. <laughs> when I, uh, the audience can decide for themselves, uh, <laughs> not that it's a competition here, but, um, that was one of the things that I knew I knew. So the, the, the fight I've been fighting in sort of the gaming space is that I think creative technology, interactive design, video games, I really believe they're sort of the next level of or in the next phase of storytelling and, and mm-hmm. experience kind of creation. And video games are widely known as empathy generators. That's kind of something that, that people say, oh. shh, babes. And so I knew that the audience that I was gonna be speaking in front of probably had little to no experience with video games. Maybe their kids or grandkids played games, but they probably didn't play games themselves. So I wanted to construct a talk around, uh, and I sort of paralleled rock music a little bit, where when rock music came out, you know, that was all the thing the, the long haired hippies were listening to, you know, it's never going to catch on. Uh, and it turns out that rock and roll became this huge phenomenon, yeah, right? That's, yeah, that's yeah. impacted and changed many, many countless people's lives. And I think video games are sort of the same way. So I was kind of, that was the angle I was coming at. But I agree, like, knowing who your audience is, is really important. And this tethers into um, kind of the public speaking angle of this which is as a, as a teacher, I'm constantly telling my students, like take a public speaking class. I know you hate it. Most people hate public speaking, but it's a skill like anything else. I'm naturally an introvert. Um, and I'm not, you know, I've, I've sort of gained skills going to networking events and doing talks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
But I think it is important, particularly for young folks to learn that skill. And before we went online today, you were kind of hinting around at that. And I wanted to get your take on that. Yeah. Um, eventually, we all have to speak up somehow, some way. And one of the very first things we learn how to do is speak. And what I've learned about myself is, I guess it's something that came a little bit natural to me. Is that, is that, oh, that's the cat. Yeah, that's the cat. <laughs> I see the cat. But um, speaking is something that I'm guessing came natural to me. Um, as a younger kid, during my elementary years, middle school and high school, I was much more quiet and reserved. Um, you know, that's when I dealt with anxiety and uncertainty and insecurities, just going through the education system in school and, you know, trying to figure out my own identity. And once I became an adult, I felt this intense freedom from all the things that I dealt with. But I didn't exactly know how to speak about it. I didn't know what to say. Yeah. But I had opportunities given to me where I was on panel discussions and once again, like the TEDx talk, someone said, you would have a great TEDx talk. I found out during TEDx that I could speak. <laughs> I did. It was my first big speaking engagement. It was my first I, time speaking. You, so, I don't think you would ever be able to tell that. So it's it's, some, it's natural for some people. Um, it's a little bit challenging for others. But I think um, it's important for everyone to find their voice. Because eventually someone's going to ask them a question that they have to stand up and speak or something that they're so passionate about. There's different art forms of connecting with people. Mm -hmm. And one of the easiest and most well-known is speaking. And the way we choose our words and the things that we say can leave people with a major impression. And I know people that have lots to say, but it's hard for them to say it once they get in front of people. Or yeah. they critique themselves and say, well, I don't sound as good as you do. I don't sound like a college professor or somebody from Harvard. And I'm like, that's well, not the point. The if we point all compared is, ourselves is to you, you we'd, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, I think it's, it's something that a lot of people should get into and start investing in because – it opens up so many doors and even if it's not a career it's good to just know how to have that skill to talk when the time comes up yeah yeah um no i i i totally agree and i think uh in the larger scale with just the way the world is i mean i think ultimately it all comes down to communication like if mm -hmm. if if we can't clearly articulate and pumpkin stop <laughs> that's a nice um, cat. yeah well, that's an affectionate cat wow she, she wants some some kisses yeah um, I, I know i know some cats that are like you can pet me but leave me alone that is an yeah affectionate cat. she she is very sweet um but I, I think communication is so important being able to articulate yourself being able to get your ideas across uh, being able to have people help understand what you're saying but also the the listening part which i think is part of your um your book as well there's there's a lot of focus on the the listening side of it you know you don't always need to be the person with the right answer sometimes just listening mm -hmm. can, it maybe it'll lead to the right answer maybe it won't but generally at a minimum it at least leaves the other person feeling heard in some way right and sometimes that is literally all people need is to be yeah. heard some people are like you're such a good listener, and I'm like, well, I'm listening, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's, it's, but um, actively listening and listening to comprehend what someone's saying to you, and sometimes just paraphrasing what they've said to you means a lot to people. So mm -hmm. the speaking and the active listening go hand in hand with each other, and I believe that's one of the best ways we can develop a sense of community and understanding each other as opposed to all the debates in the world that we can have all the time. I'm pretty sure you see it, but you can listen to people too. <laughs> and you can talk to people without having unnecessary insults and things thrown at each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I just hope that 
the people that sometimes dismiss their own voices learn that it is okay to speak up because through speaking, all of the opportunities that have come my way have come through speaking. Mm -hmm. And I don't critique myself or say I need to sound like this. The most important thing is just telling my story or sometimes telling other people's stories too. So I hope that a lot of people get into public speaking because people love it. They're listening and they're waiting on new, new stories. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think a big, at least in, in my mind, uh, a, a big thing that you do is again, I hesitate to say like community leader. Cause I think that term gets thrown around a lot. Yeah, but... I know as you mean in context, I got you. Yeah. Cause <laughs> I, I think you. that, uh, I think you're out there. I think you're connecting with folks. Um, you know, some of the initial, your and I initial conversations, you were working, um, with young men that were, having a lot of challenges. Um, and then you start working with younger, uh, younger students that had a different set of challenges. And, um, but you're ultimately helping to build a, what I think is a, a better Columbus that, that's yeah. stronger and more caring about its, its folks. Um, so I, I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Let's, I would, uh, I would like to say, uh, and this might lead right into what you may be about to get into. Um, me? something you actually helped with was giving me the opportunity to bring some of the young men from my community into a completely different environment and learn about gaming in a different sense Mm -hmm. where where they're at all they have is each other and video games was a very big part of their relationship so you know i had two young men that i mentored and you know just hung out with talked to and whatnot and they kind of isolated themselves from everybody else and had a very big dependency on each other. And they would play video games. And luckily, I met Chris. And Chris has this event called GDEX. So we just sit down and talk and start discussing things. And we come to the conclusion that, you know, I work with some kids and GDEX is a, a gaming event. And it makes sense to make sure we provide opportunities to everyone. So I had a chance to not only bring those kids with me, I brought them on stage with me Mm -hmm. so they could also speak about their gaming experiences, how they can tie it into their community. uh, Where does gaming help them? What are some of the lessons they've learned? Um, And I even talked about online gaming being very major for me. You meet some great friends on online gaming. Absolutely. You meet you meet counselors, you meet doctors, you meet people that got the same job as you, but everyone's in a space where I'm it was like we're ready to play this game. We're all here for a common goal and it's just a space of comfort. Mm-hmm. I get, I would say safe space that word gets tossed around a lot sure. sometimes, but it's a safe space. And that's why people are so vulnerable and open when we're playing video games. And like I said, with those kids, that's an experience that they remember till this day. Like we exactly. still, yeah, we still reconnect every now and then and talk about it. But they saw a completely different version of what gaming was compared to mm-hmm. what they were taught and what they saw. And that's a prime example of connecting community, and provide new opportunities. And once again, not waiting until tragedy happens. We were yep. very proactive. That was that was proactivity, and I, I really really appreciate that. Oh man, no, I so uh, just sort of setting the stage a little bit. Yeah, you and I had been talking, and then um, we, you know, we talked pretty much what you said about your experience, and then you're like, "Do you care if I bring a couple of the kids with me?" And I was like, "No, no, of course not." And you're like, "Do you care if I have them on stage?" I was like, "No, I mean, if you want to, <laughs> um, go for it." And so what what that was that session in particular is called GDEX Perspectives, which is uh, a session I started um, two years into it, I think, into GDEX. And it was designed to be a forum where people can come and talk about games, the games industry, all that stuff from some sort of different perspective. So, um, you know, we've had uh, a women in gaming panel. We've had uh, an LGBT panel before. We had one where um, a woman came and talked about game development outside of the United States, outside of Western 
countries that were developing in like Latin America and Africa and, and whatnot, making games. Um, and yours was, uh, you wanted to call it Gaming While Black, and you wanted to have um, this, this panel. And I thought that sounded like a great idea. Uh, it was super well received. And one of the things that like drives me friggin' crazy is that in Columbus, we're always talking about trying to get people into STEM, right? We want to get people in the STEM, all, yeah. all these people in the STEM. Yeah. And I'm, I get it. Like I have both a science background and an arts background. So I, I'm sort of in the, the, the creativity and the tech space, um, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of these conversations are about. But then the other conversation is the, the sort of, I hesitate to say generic, how do we get underserved people into STEM? How do we get, whatever? and then one of the things I always like, I have the answer for you right here. It's like, it turns out you keep talking about wanting to get young black men, for example, involved in STEM. Well, funny enough, young black men tend to love video games. That's a great so. entry point for, for that community to get middle and high school students into something that they probably don't even associate with STEM in that like that hard science kind of way. But it is, it's all coding and math. And obviously there's the art side to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's been, that's, your talk kind of has stuck in my head for years and years now where I'm trying, mm -hmm. when we have those conversations, I was like, look, I, there's lots of ways that we can have, you know, whatever young population you want involved in these creative tech-based activities. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're learning app development, yeah. you know, but they don't associate it as app development. They're making a game, right? Exactly. It's, it's the same thing. 100%. So it, it's a really nice entry, I think, for a lot of young folks uh, into that STEM world. You uh, want to know something? You, wow, you, something. you have my mind turning now. So. Um, I don't know if you're heavy into the basketball games or the, like NBA 2K, but that's a very, very popular game that a lot of the young kids, high schoolers, middle schoolers, they play. So what's interesting is that game gives you a lot of freedom to create your player um, all the way down to their shot, the arc on their shot, how they shoot it, mm -hmm. um, their wingspan, their height their speed so you have to do all of this math you have to uh once you start adding numbers up for the stats you have to figure out if you have enough points to add the stats to your character so you yeah. got to figure out which is most important and i'm like that's literally stem all balled up in yeah. one that's With fractional that, math right there like it's all of it but and this is a critique that i have about the education system um and I'll say the public education system in particular, that there's not much of a challenge towards traditional teaching. And sometimes we can toss terms out there. One of the terms is STEM. Everyone's STEM, 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 STEM. Well, what is STEM? Mm -hmm. Break it down. What, what exactly is it? And then what are ways we can accommodate the learning styles of, of the children and also give them something they are interested in? Yeah. Period. You know, so I, I'm 100% with you on that where we can say one thing, but are we really invested in going to make it happen with the things we have readily available to us? Yeah, I, I, I get the challenge. Like, I get it. I know that even like you mentioned many times in your book, just how busy teachers are, right? And they've got their curriculum to hit. And yeah. like, the idea of bringing in an alternate mode of education. Do we have the budget? Do we have the time? Like, oh, yep. but that's also where I think places like GDEX can come in. We have a scholarship program where uh, people can pay a discounted rate to buy tickets for uh, low income students and they get yeah. to come for free to GDEX. Uh, yeah. And then Multivarious also has a chunk of tickets that are given out for free. Um, and you know that's that is an area I've wanted to increase. Like I, I've tried reaching out to like Columbus City Schools, for example, and being like, "Can we get buses to come to GDX? You know, is there a way we can do like busing for a day where they can come and see the the games and maybe do a couple of the workshops or 
you know, maybe somebody like you or, or other folks could maybe do a little talk session on that day or something. I like uh, that. So that's oh, something we got, I, we got. We got some talking to do. We got some more planning to do. Come on now. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> in. I, I'm in. I like I, GDEX. The whole reason I created GDEX is to have it be a platform for people to be successful, to connect with each other, to share what they're working on and to learn more about the, the industry. And people are constantly blown away when, you know, I tell them, oh, I have this, this video gaming expo. And like in their mind, they've created this image, right? Very and then I start talking I, I to know them. I know I did. Yeah. And then I started talking to them. I was like, you know, in 2019, we had 88 educational sessions that included like developing design, 3D modeling. We had sound designers and music composers there. We had lawyers there helping you start up businesses or like make contracts. Um, we have a portfolio review session where you can go and bring your portfolio and talk to people who have been in the industry for 10 years. And you can then take your portfolio and turn it into something that maybe is good for applying for college or applying for a job or whatever. So we, we have this great content. Um, I'm just not, I've, I've had trouble figuring out a way to do things like, again, getting Columbus city schools in here. I mean, can we get 50 or hundred kids to come and, yes. you know, in, engage and maybe we could do, uh, I'm a partner in another company called game you, which teaches kids how to make video games. Maybe we could do a couple workshops, wow. you know, of, uh, throughout the day, like. Uh, really the the opportunities are are sort of boundless we just have to make that connection work um and I, and i think that's a, it's a really i mean obviously i'm biased right and i'm speaking to the choir here cuz everybody likes video games but right. i i really think that gaming has this sort of tremendous power that is not being used in the educational sense, I think a lot of people, when they talk education for games, they think about literally a game that is teaching you something, like right. teaching you history or whatever. Right. Um, but I think that's very, very limiting. I, I think that yes. a lot of people can learn yes. just games. A lot of games are teaching a lot of people, even social stuff, like you said, the, the online component. Yeah. Um, I've got uh, the, the game I play right now, we've got, um, a PlayStation chat room that's like, I don't know, 60 plus members right now. Mm -hmm. And we've got people, I mean, we just got a guy from Portugal who just joined mm -hmm. and, and we're chatting with him. And we've, we've got lots of different folks, lots of different backgrounds all over the world. Um, and and it, that's, that's a powerful connectivity tool. And I think also, mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I firmly believe tethering back to something you mentioned earlier that a lot of times people become trapped by what they can see in front of them. And you mentioned this with like your teachers and then, um, you know, some of your students are, are, you know, a part of that neighborhood. Maybe they don't get out of that neighborhood as much. And it's hard to conceptualize, particularly when you're a kid, where can you even go? What can you even do if you've never seen it before? Right. Like, you know, did you know that you can have a career doing this? And no. students may not even know that. No, and they so that's, don't. A, that's a big part of GDEX too, just getting students out there, getting young kids out there and realizing that like these things that you're passionate about, these things that you're excited about, this can be a career. This can be something that you can be great at or pro potentially even world-class at, you know, mm -hmm. these are things that exist. And this opportunity is not reserved for just rich people or people mm -hmm. other than you. This is an opportunity mm -hmm. that you deserve to have the, uh, you know, to be able to take advantage of. So that's my, that's my rant. Yeah, I'll feel you on that because um, I can't tell you how many children say they want to make video games. And I'm a little hesitant to even talk to them about it because there's only so much that I know, but I do mm -hmm. know through you and through different opportunities that the gaming industry is vast. You can yep. be the content creator, the, the character design, story development. Um, like have you, do you know any children that play Minecraft? Oh, totally, absolutely. Oh, have we, you seen the worlds they've created within yeah. Minecraft? We, for our younger students in Game U, uh, we have used Minecraft as a design development tool. So, it's almost scary how much they comprehend video mm -hmm. game. When you look at Minecraft, they comprehend so much. Minecraft is like 
cloaking everything that video games are. Mm-hmm. But when you break it down from designing a, a space, um, working with other people, having a character, um, colored art, all of those different things are embedded in Minecraft. And you see kids, when you give them the freedom and access to all of those things and say, it's your world, just create something, yeah. they can do it. But we don't always give them that opportunity in the real world. So I'm hoping that as time passes, we can start to really dive into that because there's most people that can tell you gaming, gaming is their thing, man. Adults, yeah. kids, you can you can bond with children through video games. So I'm hope I'm really hoping as time passes that we can adapt gaming and incorporate it into the education system. Like you said, not in a shallow sense, but let them play video games, but also teach them the lesson behind it and let it be known that this could be a career. Yep. And yeah, like you said, there's complex topics that are being taught, like conceptually in Minecraft. And there's even the ability ability to like rework uh, some of the fundamental mechanics of that game. You can change how things interact with each other, which is, like you said, there's maybe a, a layer above it but that's still code underneath. And they're, yes. they're beginning to at least see the beginnings of if this happens, then this happens, that those right. if then statements, they're beginning yeah. to, to just kind of grasp that. Uh, and the other thing that I, I find really interesting too is um, games that have like character creators. Mm-hmm. I love seeing what people come up with because p- people who don't, of see video games they're always like oh you're gonna make you're gonna make a character that looks like you right i was like no (laughs) i want to be a lizard today what are you talking about (laughs) yeah like there's there's no there's no like most of the characters i create do not look anything like me i mean 80 percent of the time they're not even you know male or whatever uh and i think that that gives a, a sort of sense of being able to create a world for yourself and I really do believe, I think reading is a, a big thing that does this too, because a lot of times when you're reading, you're conceptualizing what these characters look like. Um, and uh, I remember, I, I think this is not to jump on the Harry Potter bandwagon, but um, there, uh, I can't, was it the gamer? I can't remember, but uh, Hermione uh, was black. And everyone's like, Hermione's not black. And JK Rowling's like, at no point in this book, did I say Hermione yeah, I say. was white? <laughs> right. You know, like obviously in the movie she's white, so that's sort of like the common thing. But right. for a lot of people who are reading the books, you know, your conception of who Hermione is can be whatever you want. Yep. You know? Exactly. And the same I think with a lot of video games is you can you can turn these characters, you can build this world into however you want to construct it and play with that for a week. And then right. next week, do something new. Right. You know? And like, on the flip side of that. Being able to create yourself is also a powerful statement. Mm-hmm. Think about it, because yep. I remember we were having conversations about um, some games, like they don't even have certain skin tones. You're like, well, yep. Dad, can I create myself or somebody that reminds me of me? Um, yeah. But I, I remember when, um, what game was that? Saints Row. I was saying, well, with Saints Row, what I liked about their create character creation is you literally can do anything you want. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. it's, you can do a lot of stuff. You can game. do anything you want with your character. But it is just so cool because now you have the option to create somebody that looks just like you or mm-hmm. you can create a six foot elephant man and do walk on your hands if you want. So it's, it's powerful to, to know that um, we can take bits and pieces of ourselves and embed them in this character that's going on a journey that could be reminiscent yep. of who we are and what we go through in life. Or we can have that creative aspect um, and use that as a lens to figure out, okay, what character do I believe fits in this story? Yeah. Yeah. Like, right, I like think... say, writing a book. What, what book am I going to write? What character belongs here? So, yeah. but, um, you know, some, back of the, to... some of the best games are, um, giving you that opportunity. Mass Effect is a game that I talk about a lot where 
I have not played Mass Effect, but I think I, I trust you. I trust it, you. It's it's great. It's great, and uh, it's got a lot of different choices, a lot of ways you can kind of like move through the out. And I think those kind of things give you a almost a lens, like you said, of this is who I am, or this is who I want to be. And it kind of like lets you think about who do you want to be when you, who do you want to be when you grow up? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm still growing up. I'm still figuring <laughs> it out. Um, right. But I, I think that's, again, that's another powerful thing that, that video games can do. And, you know, it just, it sounds silly, but just opening up young people's minds to the idea just, just the idea that they don't have to be constrained by these things. Um, I think in one of the chapters of your book, um, I, I forget, it was like a, a young girl who kept getting in like a fight with this other girl. And, and you spent like part of that chapter being like, you don't have to respond mm-hmm. to this other person. Like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. you get to control your own actions. You don't have to respond on that. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's definitely one of those like, checks for maturity um and it's hard i get it but even just understanding that that like yeah i don't have to i can just walk away i don't have to let, <laughs> right i don't have to let this other person harm me you know right, right. but you know if, if if that's something you didn't think of or no, somebody presented it to you you wouldn't necessarily ever connect those pieces and i think that's something video games are exceptional at doing i would say so too because um so have you ever played The Witcher? I have. Witcher I have 3. Indeed. So I just finished it up. And oh, congrats, man. Uh, that yeah, is a, that's a journey. <laughs> so throughout the game, you have dialogue and you have a choice to make. Mm-hmm. And you could make a choice that could impact the story. And... I was notorious for picking the wrong damn thing every <laughs> single time. <laughs> Somehow, nice. I'm like, well, the last person I had a, a, you know, interaction with when I was nice to them, they tried to steal from me. So I'm gonna be kind of mean to this person and say, I'm not gonna help you. And then their whole village get burned down. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> I but, um, I know that, I know that quest. I know that <laughs> exact quest. It seems like you made the same option as me. Yeah, I actually I think I actually went the other way eventually, but it was a hard choice and I was just like, oh, do I trust this guy? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, are we are we I think we're talking about the one where it's like the beast. Yep. In the forest in the, and in the tree. The, yep. Yep. It's that one. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, I, oh, yeah. 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 That was that was that was a difficult one, and um, it it, it threw the whole story off. So I'm like, second playthrough, I'm gonna do something different. Sorry, my cat wants to play fetch now. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I. I don't know. I I could. I mean, that's part of what the show is, just talking about how awesome video games are. But I could do it. I could do it all day. Uh, I'll say. I'll I, say this to you know, kind of the top one of everything um back to what we were saying about minecraft mm-hmm. minecraft is proof that there are children that comprehend complex things that can create oh, yeah. complex environments and could literally be the future game designer but we have to recognize it and see it ourselves and make sure that we create those opportunities and like we were just saying with The Witcher, how you have decisions and choices. Um, there's so many different things that could be taught through video games as far as social skills or emotional skills. Um, in the book, there was a kid that had a nickname because he liked Mega Man. So he created this idea and identity of being a different person through a video game. Mm-hmm. And that's what helped him make it through the day. So I made sure that the time being that I I had, the short time that I had with him, that I called him the video game name that he gave me. So he could be in that space. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's video games 
should definitely be embedded and implemented in the education system because it's there. Kids know about it. Adults know about it. There's so many lessons. There's so many experiences that come from it. Stories that I could give you, stories that you could give me. It's just up to the people. It's up to us to convince the people in the education system to understand that, but it's also up to them to want to do something different. They have to want something different and they have to want something for the kids. Yeah. Well, dude, on that note, I think we should, uh, I think we should end this cause we've hit our hour here. Uh, <laughs> I, I could talk to you, I could talk to you all day, but I don't, I don't uh, yeah, it's you know. like, I'm, we just getting started, man. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. Three hours later. Um, <laughs> I do want to mention uh, your book. It's uh, So Long, Unfinished Goodbyes with the Children of COVID-19 by Dante Woods hyphen Spikes. Uh, it's on Amazon. Is it on other places or is Amazon the best way yeah, to get it? Oh, Amazon is one way to get it in Wexner books, the Wexner. Um, okay. Ohio State Wexner. You can also purchase it from them online if you want to, or you could go to the bookstore that they have. Um, Columbus Museum of Art, Prologue Bookshop, and Two Dollar Radio. Those are all in Columbus, Ohio. So to the people that's familiar with Columbus, they're in those spaces. Um, and if you see me out and about, usually I have books on me. I can get you a copy. Nice. Uh, I will put a link to the Amazon um amazon page in our show notes so that people watching it on youtube or whatever can uh check it out so uh dante before we go is there anything else uh you want to let people know about how what would be the best way for people to get a hold of you if they wanted to um the very very best way to get a hold of me is to join me on facebook dante wood spikes how, how my name is spelled in the chat or the description just add me on Facebook. That's where I'm at most of the time. Um, if you want to get in contact with me with different ideas and projects, you can go to my website. That's www.dantewoods-spikes.com. And on Instagram and Twitter, I am Dante's Eyes, D-O-N-T-E-S-E-Y-E-S. -E -E and those are the ways people can get in contact with me. Awesome. Well, Dante, thank you so much for being on the show. I really had a blast uh, chatting with you. Yeah. Um, for everybody else, thank you for being a part of the show. We will see you next week, uh, Friday at 1 p.m., as always. And Lucas, you want to take us out? Yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We uh, really appreciate it. We hope you uh, follow us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cool.